Hello friends, and welcome back to Once in a Six Side for another 3D printing focused video. In this one, I'm going to set out to try and clarify just what exactly is important when it comes to supporting models for 3D printing. And rather than creating a super technical video on how to actually add supports, we can do that in a later video. I thought instead it would be more useful to focus on the things I'm thinking about while I'm supporting a model to help you better understand what's important and what needs your consideration when doing supports. Knowing what I'm going to tell you here in this video will hopefully get you to the point where you don't even have to think about all the support settings and the nitty gritty and instead be able to intuit the demands of different geometry as you encounter them, making for a pretty easy task at the end of the day when you're faced with having to support a model yourself. I also want to address why this is so important to get right, especially if you're an independent sculptor or small business selling STL files for 3D printing. So let's start there. I'm completely convinced that the quality of pre-supported files in our little hobby absolutely makes or breaks the user experience when it comes to 3D printing. We are so very close now to a world of plug and play printed minis, it's just unbelievable how far we've come. But in my opinion, there's just one major issue right now hanging over our heads. And that's that so many pre-supported files that are out there for sale right now suck. Now don't get me wrong. A lot of them are very good with expertly and lovingly placed supports for every model. However, some files out there do have hidden issues, dangers that lurk invisibly to the untrained eye, potential risks that if left unattended will cause many a headache and woe to those who are not aware of the potential pitfalls. If you are selling digital sculpts with the intent for your customers to print them off and use in their war and role-playing games and including pre-supported files, then you absolutely need to pay attention to what I'm about to say. For everyone else, hang tight, this is for your benefit. When you're selling pre-supported files, you must understand that the majority of your customers are not technical about 3D printing. Many of them haven't even owned a printer for very long or have any experience at all with them. They do not have any interest in adding supports themselves. They do not wish to fix badly pre-supported files or even want to learn how to identify them in the first place. There is a certain level of trust being placed in you when we hand over our hard-earned hobby dollars that we are receiving a quality product that's going to print well and won't risk damaging our expensive printers. The majority of users just want to buy the files, drag and drop and print with success every time. So you've got to support every island. You've got to support all the different geometries appropriately. You've got to analyze with UV tools and you've got to test print. Failing to do these risks damaging other people's printers from cured resin left behind in the vat. Or risks unaware users thinking that maybe it's their settings or their printer that's the problem, when really it's just your files. In my opinion, for 3D printing to hit critical mass for fans of tabletop games, the end user's technical experience need not extend beyond learning how to dial in their printer and resin after the initial setup on day one and how to use the slicer. That's it. High quality and reliable pre-supported files are by far and away the biggest selling point for your models for all the reasons I've just gone over. And it doesn't matter how cool your models are because I can tell you from experience, I've decided not to buy in the past when I've seen that there's no pre-supported files included or not to print something because the pre-supports have been subpar. Often one look at the models tells me that, yeah, I'm gonna be spending an evening or maybe even an entire weekend adding supports to this. And frankly, I'd rather just do something else. More quality pre-supported files equals more successful prints equals less damaged printers equals more happy hobbyists equals more sales. There we go. So that's the why of it for those of you selling STLs. Now let's take a look at what we need to consider when supporting a model to ensure a reliable and quality print. Islands. Probably the most important thing to think about while we do supports is islands. So let's start there. One, support every island. And I'm not talking about all those one and two pixel islands that show up in UV tools. For the most part, we don't need to worry about those. They're often so small and near to other curing pixels that they'll merge with them through light bleed as the layer cures. I'm talking about five, 10, 15 or more pixel islands hanging out there in the empty space all by themselves. You can see here on this fantastic model of a commissar on horseback by Redmakers that there's a load of unsupported islands like here on the backpack this hose running down his side, in the rear of his boot. These all should have at least one support running to them, 
Else, what's pulling them away from the FEP after the layer cures? Nothing. They're going to stay on the FEP, and then it's up to chance or not whether the next layer picks them up, or if they stay behind in the vat to potentially ruin your day later. Apologies for picking on you here, Rainmakers. I really love your models, but you're still putting out concerning pre-supported files, even after I've been in touch more than once about it. 2. How big is the island being supported? This is the next thing to consider as you're supporting each island. Just how big is it? How strong will the peel forces be for each layer of this island until it connects with the rest of the model? You can easily gauge this by moving up and down through the layers and looking at the cross section of the island. In Chitu Box, the current layer is denoted by a dark blue color where we can see everything that we'll be curing for that particular layer and get a sense for the surface area the printer will be trying to peel away from the FEP. Looking at this island for example, we can see it's quite small and its peel forces will not be large at all, therefore not much support is needed. But looking at this larger island, here we can see its cross section is much larger as we move through the layers, meaning this island will need more than a couple of supports to ensure it hangs on while peeling away from the FEP. So look at your islands in an isolated manner like this, see them up until the point they connect with the rest of the model and consider how much support they will need based on the surface area curing during the printing of that island. These two things are super important, so I'm going to take just another minute here to illustrate what's going on to be as clear as I can and really drive these points home. Here's a model I've designed for this demonstration, and as you can see, if we print it in this orientation, that there's a range of islands from large to small. Notice as we move up through the layers, each island has nothing but its own supports to rely on until eventually all these islands join together, at which point the load of each successive layer becomes shared by all the supports. You should now change your frame of reference to consider this whole model as one island and keep hunting through the layers to analyze the upcoming peel forces to decide if even more supports are needed. Now let's remove the supports for one of the islands and have a look at what happens. Okay, so we can see as this layer cures, the supports that have printed thus far are all reaching down and pulling their respective islands up off the FEP. However, this one here, there's no support to do that. So what happens is the first layer of this island will cure here on the FEP, but then it will not be pulled up with the build plate after this layer is finished. This whole island will now just continue to cure on the FEP, growing in size according to the shapes of the later layers. When the island's layers are finally finished and it connects up with the rest of the model, one of two things can happen. The failed island will either bond to the rest of the print and peel up and away from the FEP, or it won't and it will stay right where it is, which if you don't catch it after the print, will be laying in wait to be crushed into your FEP and LCD at the beginning of your next print. Even if your print does successfully manage to pick up cured resin from the FEP later on, there's no guarantee it holds onto it either. Depending on how well it managed to bond, it may just fall away again before the print finishes. So to reiterate, support all your islands and support them accordingly. Let's talk about suction cups next. This is something that will often come up with hollow models. And so you'll want to keep an eye out for these when working on those, though they can arise on non-hollow models depending on the topology of the model and the orientation toward the build plate. For this example, I'm going to be working on this skull, which has been sculpted by a good buddy of mine. If you'd like to buy this model and help my friend out, there's going to be a link in the description to his Colts 3D page where you can pick this up. He's a talented oil painter and still pretty new to 3D design, but I reckon he's a natural. Just look at the detail on this thing. It's awesome. Anyway, so here we can see the model has been hollowed and I'm in the process of adding supports. If we again move up and down through the layers here, considering this whole body as an island, we can see that each of these layers as they cure are essentially creating a big suction cup against the FEP. So now not only are our supports going to have to fight the peel forces of the cured resin after the lift at the end of each layer, they're now having to fight against the suction force of this cup as well. The solution here is simple. All you have to do is make sure there's a drain hole as close to the beginning of the cup as possible. Here's what that looks like in this particular instance with a 3mm hole. This is also important for draining and washing the model out after printing. Hollow models, if not given drain holes, will have uncured resin inside, which over time will off-gas and create positive pressure inside the part, eventually leading to a fracture and a mess of uncured resin. Next up, 
warping. Take a look at the rear of this artillery gun where I neglected to properly support it the first time around. Notice how it warps to one side here? That's from those peel forces and insufficient supports to keep the model from deforming. As each freshly cured layer peels away from the FEP, it's bending, causing the overall part to skew in this direction. This was remedied by adding extra supports along this edge here to counteract that bending, resulting in a part that's not warped. Okay, two more rapid fire things to keep in mind when doing supports. The first is when you hollow a model, don't forget that there will more than likely now be islands inside that you need to support as well. So don't forget about those. I typically just throw heavies on them with the intent to leave them in there after the wash and cure because who wants to go fishing through tiny holes to remove interior supports? They're invisible anyway. The other is pay attention to how close the middle of your supports are to the model. It can often look like there's enough space between the two, but I've made this error multiple times and my support has bonded to the model, leaving heavy scarring upon removal. So always caution on the side of more distance between supports and the model. Last but not least, and really before anything, you actually want to consider this first, but knowing everything that came before is key to properly go about this part of the process. And that is how you orient your model to the build plate in the first place. There's a rule of thumb out there that comes up often that you should always tilt back your model 30 to 40 degrees or so on the X or Y axes. But honestly, that's not very helpful advice if you don't know why we're doing that in the first place, as not all models will benefit from that same treatment. You need to consider each model independently for the best orientation, and there are a few factors to consider when doing this. The first is, what details are most important to preserve for you? Whichever parts of your model end up directly facing the build plate are going to be where the supports end up, and so will be where the scarring from the supports is visible it's best to, where you can, have parts of your model that are least likely to be visible facing the build plate. Sometimes though, a model can have many details that will require supports if you choose such an orientation. Therefore, choosing another way could be a trade-off that you want to make. Cleanup required in a visible area afterwards, but less supports needed on those fine detail parts. It really depends on what's important for your model. Lastly, we have to consider large, flat surfaces. Wherever you can, avoid at all cost having these parallel to the build plate. Doing so will lead to undulations in the surface between supports, or even outright failure from large peel forces overpowering your supports. This is where that 30 to 40 degree tilt rule will come in handy. Parts like these will always print better when pitched away from the build plate. Finally, I do recommend running your files through UV tools to verify if you've missed any islands. There's already fantastic videos here on YouTube that will show you how to use UV tools if you're not familiar, so I'll link a good one in the description for you as well. So with all those things now floating around in your brain, you should be well equipped now to tackle any model supports. As for support settings, I recommend being a little more conservative than some. I personally try to take my lights no lighter than 0.26mm at the tip and 0.9mm at the base with a 3mm length. But let me know below if you'd like to see a video where I support a model from start to finish, including the UV tools workflow. I could go into detail on my preferred settings there if that's something that would interest you. My slicer of choice is Chitubox, though the principles outlined in this video apply to supports no matter what software you use. Lychee is a great choice too, I just prefer Chitubox. Both are excellent, don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Thank you for watching, I hope this one has been informative and helpful, and I'll be seeing you again soon. Bye bye Oh, I almost forgot! Please do consider going over to my Colts 3D page and checking out my two designs that are currently available there. The Imperial Outpost and the Comms Tower. I'm really proud of these two little creations, and I would love it if you would uh, pick up one or two and print them off and start using them in your war games. That would just be the best thing ever. Alright, see ya.